Wise Studies presents The Philosophy of the Yoga Sutra with Karen O'Brien Kopp. At Wise Studies, we are committed to illuminating the texts and teachings of the world's great contemplative traditions. In this series, Karen examines the seminal text, the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. In this first session, Karen gives an overview of the Yoga Sutra and discusses the historical and philosophical background that gives rise to this influential text. Hello and welcome to this lecture series on the Yoga Sutra. In this course, we'll be reading through the Yoga Sutra together. This is often considered as a key text in the study of yoga and as the first systematized or formal account of the discipline of yoga. This doesn't mean that the text invents the tradition or puts forward ideas or practices that are completely new, but there is a distinction between the system of yoga that is presented in this classical text and what we might call proto-yoga or early archaic yoga that existed before it. In this episode, we will be locating the Yoga Sutra in its historical context and we'll be reviewing the broad themes of the text. In each of the next four episodes, we'll be selecting each one of the four chapters in turn and reading through those with reflection. So let's start with the historical context. I would like to firstly address three questions of the provenance or origin of this text, looking at the date, at issues around the authorship, and actually at the title itself. So let's think about the date first. The date range for the text is from around the 2nd century before the Common Era to, at the upper limit, the 4th or 5th century of the Common Era. And we are talking here about the classical period of Indic history. Now the reason for this date range is partly the debate as to whether this was an oral text or a written text when it was first put together. As I mentioned, the Yoga Sutra does not invent the tradition of yoga, but it really represents an apex of knowledge, the knowledge that existed up to that point. And it draws together the ideas from the early Vedic period, from other texts such as the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of the Mahabharata, and also other parts of the Mahabharata. And it weaves those ideas together with concurrent practices and philosophies also from the Buddhist tradition and the Jain tradition. Now, there are some historians who date the early development of yoga all the way back to the second millennium BCE, to the Indus Valley civilization. And this represents the period of the early urban societies in the Indian subcontinent. There were two cities in particular that were important in the Indus Valley civilization. There was Mahenjo Daro and Harappa. And archaeologists have found seals in both of these sites, which depict human figures in what appear to be a seated posture with some kind of formality to it. And these seals date to perhaps 1500 to 2000 BCE. However, there is a certain amount of debate as to what exactly is being depicted on these seals. Is it a person in a yoga posture? Is it some other is it some other kind of ritual context? Or is it simply a person depicted in a seated 
position unrelated to yoga. Other historians point towards a later date for the early beginnings of what we now call yoga to the renunciate traditions of the shramanas, ascetic communities that emerged in the northeastern part of the Indian subcontinent, somewhere around the 7th to the 8th century BCE. The texts that grew out of the Shramana period included the Upanishads, which we date to the first millennium BCE, and in these important texts we encounter early descriptions of meditation and philosophy, those strands of early yogic practice and thought which inform the classical formulation that we encounter in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. There are also other important accounts of yoga. As I mentioned, the Bhagavad Gita contains a long dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, which reflect on yoga as a form of engagement and action with the world. And in Book 12 of the Mahabharata, the Shanti Parvan, there is also an important discussion of yoga in a part of the text called the Moksha Dharma. Of course, the term yoga has a provenance in the early Vedic textual tradition. If we go back to the early Vedas, we will find the word yoga. Its meaning at this point in textual history is much more general and is loosely clustered around ideas of purpose, of effort, application, and also a sense of conjoining or unity. The Yoga Sutra weaves together these different strands of thought and therefore has a character of compilation, of pulling together disparate strands and weaving them into a coherent whole. If we think about the early beginnings of the text as rooted in oral culture, then we may well date parts of the text to the early centuries BCE. However, it's quite likely that the version of the Yoga Sutra that was put together by an author called Patanjali was written down. And we know that writing was introduced to the Indian subcontinent around the 1st or 2nd century BCE. However, because of this compilatory character of the text, we know that parts of the text were certainly in circulation in philosophical and religious circles well before the 3rd, 4th, 5th century of the Common Era. And these parts may well have started life as a form of oral recitation. So we'll come back to that idea in a few moments. Let's now think about the question of authorship and ask that question, who was Patanjali? As with the date, the authorship of the text is itself a subject of debate and discussion in scholarly and historical circles. Let's first of all think about this notion of authorship. The text is attributed to an author called Patanjali, but the notion of authorship in this classical period in Indic history is not quite how we view authorship in the modern period. In Indic religious culture, it wasn't important to think about authorship in terms of original composition. In fact, a text was valued because it was situated within a tradition that already existed. And a text was regarded as authoritative because it was able to align itself to precedent, either a philosophical school of thought, perhaps to align itself to a name that had already been established, in the field, 
to align itself to a particular teacher or to align itself to a textual tradition, such as the Vedas. So when we talk about Patanjali, we should bear in mind that there may not have been a distinct historical figure called Patanjali. The attributing of the Yoga Sutra to Patanjali may well have been a convention, a way of stating the authority of this text. Because there is in fact another Patanjali who existed in this philosophical religious environment. And that Patanjali is a little bit easier to date. He was the author of an important grammatical treatise called the Mahabhashya. And this text emerged somewhere around the 2nd century BCE, also written in the sutra form. There have been some historians who have put the two Patanjalis together and claimed that, in fact, the Patanjali who gave us the Yoga Sutra is also the Patanjali who gave us this important work on grammar. It is difficult to reconcile those two historical authors as one simply because the dating of the Yoga Sutra most likely comes some centuries after the Mahabhashya, the work on grammar. There's also another level to this debate about the authorship of the text. In fact, another Patanjali emerges slightly later in history And this Patanjali is revered as being not only the author of the Yoga Sutra, not only the author of the grammatical treatise, the Mahabhashya, but also an author with a connection to an important work on Ayurveda. So a sage who also has mastery of knowledge of medicine. And this Patanjali who begins to appear in literature some centuries after the Yoga Sutra, is a semi-divine being, a Shesha Naga, a serpent being. He's half man, half serpent. And he is identified as a semi-divine being who witnesses the dance of Shiva. And we can see these iconic iconographic representations of Badanjali, particularly in South India today, as half man, half serpent. However, we need to be aware of the detail that underpins the identity of each of these three Patanjalis and to carefully assess whether there is enough evidence to support the notion of one Patanjali who spanned the centuries and was a master in these three separate fields of yoga, medicine, or Ayurveda, and grammar. The evidence does point to the first two Patanjalis that I discussed being separate historical figures, and the third Patanjali, the Sheshanaga, the half-man, half-serpent, being a mythical rendition of this important figure in early Indic religious history. It is also quite likely that when we're thinking of how the Yoga Sutra was put together, that we may be thinking of more than one person. We may be thinking of an individual who had an editorial capacity to weave together these important strands of prior thought on yoga with some additions, or we may be thinking of a group of editors and authors working together to create this text. I'd like now to think about this third point of provenance in how we think about the Yoga Sutras historically. And that brings me to the title of the work. There is an alternative title by which we can name this work, and that is the Patanjala Yoga Shastra. 
This means that we consider Patanjali as the editor or author not only of the sutras, but of the earliest commentary that is known about that accompanies the sutras. And this is called the Yoga Bhashya. It is attributed to an author called Vyasa. And the standard interpretation has often been to think about these two texts as separated by a century or so. So the Yoga Sutra comes first and is then followed by the Yoga Bhashya. However, scholarship is now moving towards thinking about these texts as quite probably having been produced at the same time by the same person. 